The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. As it turns out, everything in electronics turns on, which means circuits need power. Hi, my name is James and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. On this show, we talk about equipment for your electronics workbench. In this video, I take you through the basics of how to use a bench power supply. Bench power supplies come in multiple configurations. Here is a single output adjustable supply, and this one has multiple outputs. Now, on multiple output supplies, it is common for them to combine adjustable with fixed outputs. The controls tend to be straightforward. Turn the knob and the output voltage changes. Usually, supplies feature a banana jack connector. These screw types are cool because you can unscrew them and insert bare wires into them, making them a bit more flexible. When I'm shopping for a power supply, I look for two features. The first is a current limit control. On this supply, not only can we adjust the output voltage, but we can also limit the output current. That is very useful when you want to protect a circuit. The next feature I want is an output control like this one. It makes it very easy to set the voltage and current before applying power to a circuit. Now, some supplies will have an output control for each output or a single enable like this one. Take a note that on this single output supply, it only has the AC on and off. That's not terrible, but if I have a choice, I prefer to have a supply with a separate output control. For device under test or DUT or DUT, I'm using this 75 ohm power resistor. It's rated for 50 watts, although you probably wouldn't want to handle it when it dissipates that much heat. First, we'll set the output to, I don't know, 12 volts. Now, this supply can output 5 amps, which is really high, so let's set the current limit as well. Well, wait a minute. The knob's not doing anything. What gives? Well, these meters measure what is coming out of the power supply, and right now it's turned off. If I turn it on, still it's going to be zero because there's nothing connected. The way we set the current limit is by shorting the leads together. Now I can dial in a nice, safe 100 milliamps. What in Ohm's name is all of that noise? Oh, it's a bunch of angry comments about shorting out the supply. Well, let me address a few things. Shorting the cables in this manner won't burn anything up. As you can see, the supply is outputting zero volts, or close to it. So the wires aren't dissipating much power. Also, if you read the manual, it says to set the current limit with this exact method. Now, I would agree there's one minor step we could have done to make this better, and that's we should have turned off the output, then connected the leads, and then turned the output back on. That way, there's no possibility for sparks to occur. Oh, and don't forget to turn the output off before you connect your device under test. Okay, now my resistor is hooked up and I can enable the output. Oh, come on! Why is this not 12 volts? I set it to 12, why is it so low? Well, I do know it's not because of this supply, because I saw the same thing happen with my Tenma portable supply, which I reviewed in an earlier episode. So then what is happening now? Well, the supply is doing exactly what we told it to do. It is limiting its output current to 100 milliamps by reducing the output voltage. As I increase the current limit, the output voltage will go up as well. This is what makes current limiting so powerful. For example, whenever I turn on a board for the first time, I always set the current to a very low value. That way, if there's some kind of problem, the components might still survive. The Tenma supply that I'm using can output 32 volts and 5 amps on its adjustable outputs but those outputs can also be placed in parallel to increase their output current to 10 amps or in series to increase their output voltage to 60 volts. Now, 
putting 60 volts across this resistor causes it to dissipate about 52 watts and get over 100 degrees C. So to keep from burning myself, I'm going to use this electronic load instead to demonstrate these features. You can think of this box as an electronically controlled resistor. It's a little more complicated than that, but that'll be a subject for another video. When using series or parallel mode, you'll use a combination of the banana jacks. Double check your supplies manual to know which to use. For this supply, we connect channel one to the positive and channel two to the negative. And here I'm connecting to my electronic load, but you would connect that to whatever it is you wanna power. First, I'm gonna make sure that the output is off, and then I'm going to push in one of these two switches. If I look at the diagram, it says that for series, one button needs to be in and the other needs to be out. Now, notice what happened. Both channels are showing the same voltage and they track, but only one of the knobs is active. If we look at the voltage on our loads voltmeter, we can see that it is twice the value of the supply. And that is because the two channels are in series. Now to switch to parallel mode, the first thing I'm going to do is turn off the output and then I'm going to press the switches so that we get parallel tracking, which means they both need to be pushed in. Now, when I turn on the output and my load, I can see that I'm outputting two amps on each channel, but the meter is syncing four amps. The last point I wanna make around this electronic load is that if you happen to use a device like this to test the supply, know that depending on which mode it is operating in, it will affect how the power supply's current limiter works. In fact, it is common for a supply to just shut its output off instead of lowering the output when dealing with an active load like this one. And the reason for that is going to be explained in a future video. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Use traditional resistors when you wanna test out your supply's current limiting. If anything, they're a lot quieter than the fan in this guy. Let's talk about the three posts on the supply outputs. You'll notice there is a positive, negative, and ground. So then if you're trying to hook up something like this Arduino Nano, do you connect the supplies GND to the Arduino's GND? The answer is no. Bench supplies have floating outputs. Their positive and negative are not referenced to earth ground, which by the way is why it is so easy to put them in series or parallel. The GND connector is actually connected to the supply's earth ground conductor. So an example of this usage would be if you want to ground a circuit's chassis to earth ground while you work on it. The last bit we cover is on cables. There are three or four types you might want to get when getting a bench power supply. I mostly use these mini grabber styles, but I also find the alligator clips useful, especially for making ground connections. You'll also want to have some banana to banana cables as well. These make it really easy to connect to other instruments like a multimeter, especially if they have a through connector that lets you stack them. If you check the show notes for this episode, there are links to example cables. Oh, and the fourth type is basically a banana jack with the end missing. You never know when you'll need these. Bench power supplies are a powerful tool for your electronics workbench. For links to the products I mentioned in this episode, check the link in the description for where to find the show notes over on the Element 14 community. You know, I really do like making these basics episodes. So what other electronics tools would you like me to cover? Let me know that over on Element 14 as well. For now, it is time for me to get back to powering stuff on my electronics workbench. <laughs>